you all very much. And we'll get this started here. Of course, naturally, OK, good. Well, we'll just do it this way. All right. Dynalite and the B&H event space are presenting Making the Jump to Studio Flash. And I'm Kevin Ames, and I'm real excited to be here to uh, help you look at how electronic flash works and how you can use it. And this is a part, part of primer to it, to give you an idea of how to put it into your system, how to, do it, how to add it to what you're doing right now. And the information I'm giving you, while it's based on Dynalite products, it's pretty much across the board on any system that you choose to purchase, including speed lights, actually. So I want to start with this photograph of Lexi. And I made this one on film with a Hasselblad uh, 250 millimeter sonar lens. Gosh, this has got to be 24, 25 years old. And the idea was we wanted to have, want to tell a story of a young woman looking out of a torn screen door and let people kind of figure out whatever they wanted to know as far as how, why she was there, what the story was, what the emotions were. And we had a great time doing this. And it's, you know, was it in the studio? Was it on location? It doesn't really matter. But lighting is important. And we're going to go through a lot of these photographs today and talk about how they were done and why flash really makes a difference. Well, first of all, it freezes action. You can always work at a really high shutter speed. And here, we were all done with a shot. And I said, you really want to tear that screen door, don't you? And she says, yeah, I really do. And I said, go ahead and make a face. So we, got, we played and we got some more photographs that we wouldn't have gotten otherwise. And uh, here's the behind the scenes. So nothing in reality is what it seems in a photograph. You have that one look of the wistful woman, and then you find out it's uh, an 18-year-old girl in a camisole top and boxer shorts and Doc Martin boots. So it's, it's completely taken away from what we think it would be. So let's talk about Studio Flash, just for fun, where you can use it. Well, you can use it on location, obviously. Uh, we've had a location. Actually, wherever you use it, whether it's in a studio, in a hotel, outside on the street, it's, they're all locations. You can use it for fill light. So if you've got too contrasty a situation, you can lower the contrast by adding flash. You can use it as a main light, as you saw in the previous photograph. You can use it and combine it with natural light. And that's really wonderful because you can emulate natural light and um, it, it, it's just great to be able to combine them. Best of all, you can use it in the dark. So when natural light goes away, which it seems to do every evening, uh, and it's getting earlier and earlier that you can't shoot around anymore, but you can use it anywhere, you can use it anytime, and you can even use it with your existing speed lights. So this is not something that's going to take the speed lights that you've already learned how to use and replace them it's going to augment them. And we're going to talk a little bit about speed lights in conjunction with electronic flash studio systems. This is flipping the story completely around. Here, the light is the sunrise. I was on the top of this building all night long. I'm 16 stories up in the air. And there's a crane lifting this big chiller up. This is the product. And the company that sells and installs them wanted this photograph and all of the logistics took it took about three days to get everything set plus I had to do test photographs on top of the building all night long to make sure I could get the exposures and see where they were going to swing this big chiller and how they were going to get it in and that's I got one photograph I had one shot but everything worked the stuff is really it's lightweight easy to carry there are two dyna lights going on there there's one on the guys and then there's one filling in everything else so a lot of fun. Another location, this is a saw. It's a diamond saw blade about this big around. And it's cutting marble. And this, again, shot on film years and years ago. But with a dynalite in the background shining through the blades, and the high speed of the flash is enough to stop the edges of the little T 
teeth that are there just to give you this sense of motion. Now, Flash is daylight colored, and I wanted a really rich blue, so I put tungsten lights on the saw itself and exposed for those and adjusted the flash down so that it wasn't too bright. And with tungsten film, I was getting that blue color coming in from the daylight colored flash. And it's just a really, I think, a very effective photograph. A lot of times, I'll be doing architecture interiors and in this case, this is how it was lit, except the shower had no lights in it. And for some reason, the couple's bathtub in the background had blue LEDs in it. Well, I travel with a set of gels for my flashes. And so I had my assistant uh, take one of the Dynalite heads and just hold it up. And we just did several pops. And I painted them together in Photoshop. Now, another product that Dynalite makes are their portable flash systems. And they're just introducing the Baja series. That's the Baja B4. And this was shot in the Philippines with some of the Baja lights uh, about four years ago. Uh, I'm in Tagaytay, which is a, a little city north of Manila. And this is an old, old house. It was built in like the 1400s. So there's a light in the background washing over the utensils and then another one of these portable flashes and a soft box lighting the model and then the light from behind in the stained glass window that's natural light that's sunlight coming in from behind and reflecting on the polished wooden wooden floor so that's a little more complicated setup this one is very very simple uh, this is young Christopher this is the beginning of life and it's a soft box and the father is draped in black velvet. So I just wrapped black velvet around him and just had him hold his hands out. And uh, that's all there is to it, very, very easy. Now, I moved the exposure up just a little bit so we could get that really pale skin. And I think it works just, just very eloquently, very beautiful. On the other side, this is about the end of life. Uh, this is my friend Mark, who for years and years was an actor here in New York and he finally came back to Atlanta and was diagnosed with terminal cancer and he allowed me to document his passing and there were some sad times this was right after he found out that he wasn't going to live much longer and I was able to set up a light panel the Dynalite behind and I just talked to him and made photographs and this is the one that I believe really tells the anguish of learning that thing that we're all going to learn at some point in our lives. So kind of a downer, but we've got some wonderful photographs of him on his last birthday party with everybody, and he's got a clown hat, and all, all of his family was there, and they've all got pictures with him because he let me document this. So it was, it was really a wonderfully moving thing for him and for his family, and it's been long enough now that I'm going to release the photographs and uh, give them the gifts because uh, he was such a good friend. On a happier note, back in 1996, Atlanta hit the international scene. We hosted a little set of games called the Olympics. And after every Olympics, there's a Paralympic game. And this was uh, my contribution to it. I set up a studio in the Olympic Village and photographed anybody that had won a medal. And quite frankly, I photographed people that didn't because I thought these athletes were amazing. Well, Gabrielle came in to the studio and I'd already closed it, I'd put my lights away and uh, we were gonna leave the background up so that wasn't a big deal. But he says, I gotta have my picture made. Gotta have my picture made with my medal. And I said, what? And he says, no, right now, I, I gotta do it. I can't come back tomorrow, you gotta do it now. Well, the story was, he's a swimmer. Now, take a look, he's got one leg, two not quite half arms and he gets around by using a bicycle and in his event third place and fourth place had been disqualified so he got the bronze medal and he was terrified that the officials were going to change their mind so he wanted a photograph to memorialize his accomplishment and again this was shot on Triax film digital really wasn't possible then to this quality and I shot a couple of Polaroids and gave him some so he could take them back to Chile. I saw him the last Sunday of the games. He was going by on his bike and I said, Gabrielle, do you have the medal? And he held it up and smiled and he also had the Polaroid. So it was, it was really, really fun. Um, 
another shot from this series, and I've held them for 20 years because I want to do a retrospective. I really haven't shared these pictures in public. So this is, uh, you know, three gold medal winners right there, three events. The girl in the front is the steering person, and the girl in the back is blind. She's the motor. She's the one that makes it go. And they won, like I said, three gold medals. I also shoot food. And food is a lot of fun to shoot because you can try different kinds of lighting. Here we have a, a Danish style breakfast featuring uh, radishes, fresh bread, and uh, butter, crackers. And the light is a Dynalite head shining through a glass brick. There's also another one with just a little tiny bit of fill to open the shadows up just a little bit. So a very simple, easy shot to do. And with electronic flash, I've got all kinds of control over what I'm doing. Jewelry. This amulet is about this tall right here. And it features the world's only piece of purple gold. The um, gem itself is carved by Bernd Munsteiner, who is finally retired. He's one of the world-class gem carvers. And the designer wanted record photographs of the piece. So this is two lights. I've got a big overhead softbox. I'm shooting it with a 105 millimeter f2.8 lens from Sigma. And on the background, on the wall in my studio, I have a single Dynalite head with a grid spot on it. And that's what's causing the glow. You'll see another use of that in just a minute. Kids, God, they're wonderful. They're so much fun to shoot. They are delightful, and when you get a photograph like this, it's really, really wonderful. I did do a little Photoshop manipulation to change the colors of the polka dots to make them fit the color that's on the first stripe of little Patrick's top there. But again, one simple, big beauty dish, and boom. It's all I needed, single light. You can do a lot with just one light. If you want to get a little more complicated, bring the light in from behind. This is mainly backlit, again with another panel, filling it in so that the contrast doesn't get too great. And uh, well, if you love chocolate, this has got to make you hungry. Another jewelry photograph. This pin is about this big in diameter, and those are sapphires. I didn't realize that sapphires came in so many different colors, but this is all of the colors that sapphires come in or can be heat treated or irradiated to produce. I wanted to have this showing the center gem with the color in the background, matching it very closely. So I took a Dynalite head with a grid spot holder and a piece of uh, fuchsia colored gel, put it on the back wall in my studio, and then suspended this in the foreground. I retouched out what was holding it. And this had been worn, so it had little black flecks of lint all through it. So I spent hours with tweezers pulling them out and then finishing it in Photoshop, getting rid of all of those little hairs. And I finally was talking to the designer. I saw her at a show and I showed her the picture. And, and um, I said, she said a heck of a time getting all of the lint out. And she said, well, there's a real easy way to do that. You just hold it over a cigarette lighter and they burn away and fall out. You know, like, like I'm going to take a piece of jewelry like this and heat it with a cigarette lighter. Good for her. Back in the days of film, we really wanted to do what we can do today in Photoshop. So here is a bunch of heads and actually two sets. One set is for the star background, and the other set is for the credit cards and all of the lights. And then the film is moved from camera to camera in order to make the multiple exposure. The card reader itself has a really bright tungsten light going on, and after I made the exposure for the cards and the colors in the background, again, those are grid spots with gels on them, I slipped a piece of glass that I'd hit with hairspray to make it glow. Now we do all of that stuff in post and digital. But back then it was a challenge, and so when David says I'm kind of old school, uh, I have to admit he's right. Some more food. Again, this is uh, a main and a fill. The main is casting the shadow that you see on the edge of the plate. The fill is giving that wonderful even tone on the fork. 
Um, I was here in October a couple of years ago and got out about two hours before you had that little storm named Sandy. And there's a um, glass blowing company in Brooklyn called Buston Kutch and they got hit really hard. A friend of mine has several of their pieces so I photographed them and gave them to the, to the people to use as promotion to help them get their studio back online. Two lights on the background, evenly lighting the white, and I'll show you how to do that in a little bit, uh, teach you exactly how to do it. And then one big light so I don't have a whole bunch of sparkly little highlights because this is uh, glass and it's got all kinds of curves and shapes. And if I don't use a really, really big light source, it's going to have those little pinprick dots of light particularly when you try to use a speed light, which are so small uh, and acute. They're very bright, but they're, they're so small and harsh. So I really like having the power to make big lighting decisions. Speaking of big lighting decisions, one of my early clients' business was renovating hotel rooms, and they wanted something to show that they could do really great bathrooms. So I went to and this was before Home Depot. You can get an idea how long ago it was. Uh, they also cut out the marble, the same company that was doing the saw. So they made this vanity for me, and it just has the hole. There's no sink bowl in it. And I mounted up the faucets and uh, valve. And the set is 30 feet long. Now, it's set horizontally. And in the back, there's a piece of white plexiglass, 4 by 8 feet. And I was shooting it with a 4x5 view camera. So I could put a light through the ground glass, and it would project the exact shape of the bowl. And then I could come in and draw the size I needed for a piece of black tin foil to go over it, and then put a purple gel behind it. And I hit the Dynalite flashes at 2,000 watt seconds 48 times to build the exposure. It's a whole lot easier now. We can do this in Photoshop in about a half an hour, well, about two hours, where back then it took about three weeks to execute this photograph. Yeah. But that was back when time on the system was uh, selling at $1,500 an hour, and it would have been horribly expensive to do this. A truck backed up to the loading dock of my studio and unloaded a whole lot of books for a used book dealer for educational books. We cast a couple of models, put a big soft box over the top with a couple of Dynalite heads in it, and there's the illustration that carried them for years and years. So what am I talking about when I'm talking about these Dynalite lights? Well, I want to go over the anatomy of a power pack with you today and hit all of the high points. It starts with power. You don't have to use batteries, although Dynalite makes a portable battery that will give you 700 full power flashes out of one of these packs. So you can take it on location with you. It uses 110 volts, and you've got a power switch. You turn it on, the pack is ready to go. On the other side, you have the ready test button. When you push it, they'll fire, and you can use it for discharging the pack. More about that in a minute. You also have a way of trimming the pack, so you can turn the whole pack up or down, up to two stops, and you can see the variator there. It works in two tenths of a stop increments, and that is all done mechanically, so you don't have to worry about any digital boards failing. It's a switch. It's rugged. It takes the pounding. Uh, these packs are basically bulletproof. After you turn it down, you always hit the ready test at least once after lowering the power to discharge the capacitors. Okay, come on, there we go. So, the variator at full power. Now, when you increase the power, you don't have to do anything. So turning it up, you don't have to discharge it. Turning it down, you always discharge it. If you forget, your light reading will be just the same as it was before you turned it down the first time you take a light reading, then you'll get the accurate reading. Now, you've heard me say watt seconds, and I thought I would take a moment to define it. The problem is that a lot of time you get uh, class and you, gotta hear, you hear a bunch of buzzwords, and nobody bothers to tell you what those buzzwords mean. Well, watt seconds 
are the amount of light made by one watt of power through the flash tube for one second. So the more watt seconds you have, the more light you have. Now, let's look at how a pack is laid out. Think of it as you're dividing it in half. One half of it is a 400 watt second pack. That's bank A. You see the A there? And then you have bank B. So you've got two 400 watt second power packs built into one. And again, with the variator, you can trim both of them down to 100 watt seconds. So you've got two 400 watt second power packs built into one. Let's take a look at how it works. At quarter power, with that rocker switch, you have 100 watt seconds. And we're going to get into the math, and you'll understand this as we get into the, into the program a little farther. Half power is 200 watt seconds. So you've doubled the amount of power. Now when you double the amount of power, you increase, you have to stop down by one f-stop. So you increase the light by one stop. So full power would be 400 watt seconds or two stops. So you have two stops of variation just by turning the one side up or down and another two stops using the variator. So you've got that on both sides. So you can ratio the images from one side to the other. If you want one brighter, maybe you have that at 200 watt seconds at half power and the other side you put it at quarter power. So you'd have a fill and a ratio so that the, the light looks like it's got some depth, you've got some shadows. Okay. Now, if we're at full power on both of them at 400 watt seconds, we're using all the power the pack has. There is a ratio switch. When it's on ratio, it separates the two banks. So A and B are separate, and the two sockets on the A side share 400 watt seconds, and the two sockets on the B side share 400 watt seconds. So if you plug one head into one of those sockets on the A side, it gets 400 watt seconds. If you plug two of them in, they share the 400, they'd be 200 apiece. Same thing holds true for the B side. Now, switching the switch down to combine changes things. What it does is it adds A plus B. So if you have 400 watt seconds on A and 400 watt seconds on B, you add them together and all of the sockets are now sharing the 800 watt seconds. So you plug one into any one of the four sockets, you plug a head into one of those, it gets 800 watt seconds. If you plug two of them in, they each have 400. So if you need a lot of power, and I'm going to show you an example of where you're going to use the full power of the pack in a little bit. If you need a lot of power, you've got it. Now, I've spent a lot of time explaining how the switching works, how the variators work, and I don't want you to think this is just specific to Dynalite. Although the circuit that they're using was developed uh, about 30 years ago, and they've been basically laying the packs out exactly the same with new modern components, of course. But if you bought a pack 30 years ago, it's laid out almost identically today. So once you get one, you know how to use it. The other thing is that most brands of lights work this exact same way. There's really only one way to do this. Now, they may have digital processors in there that give you a tenth of a stop. Uh, difference like the Baja there. But the reality is that it's all about watt seconds, increasing them or decreasing them to change the amount of light. Interestingly enough, speed lights work this way too, except each one is its own bank. So if you're working with speed lights and you know how to use those, you already have a leg up on how you're going to use Studio Flash, the power packs and heads. Now, speed lights generally, for the most part, give you about 60 watt seconds. What they've done is they've engineered them to give you as much light output as possible from that little head. So they're engineered to be incredibly bright 
and that doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to give you a high quality light as far as if you're shooting a model you're going to get a hot spot on her face you have to make you have to make that light bigger to make it softer to make that highlight spread out so these are designed to really throw a lot of light a long distance but they're not designed to necessarily be pretty Dynalites, on the other hand, are absolutely designed to be pretty. Now, let's take just a, a little comparison for a moment. And the, everything that you see here is actually in relation size-wise. If you take two of, my, of the Canon speed lights, you can cover up the front of the Dynalite power pack. That's how small the power packs are. So to give you an idea, this is the number of speed lights you'd have to have in order to equal the amount of power in one of the power packs. You have to have 13 of them. Now at, at $600 a piece, now I realize at B&H there are a lot less money here, but at list of $600 a piece, that's about $6,800 roughly. And the weight on them is about six times more than a Dynalite power pack. So it's not a real efficient way to get a lot of light. Studio Flash is the way to do that. So talking about using flash, I'm going to explain what exposure is. We're going to talk in depth about measuring light, and we're going to talk about how to do it with reflected meters and with incident, and which one is different, how they're different, and how to use each one, and where to use each one, and where you'll find them. So what is exposure? Exposure is simply the amount of light needed Exposure is the amount of light needed to reveal the true tone of the subject. There we go. That's all it is. Now, there are two types of meters, and we're going to start with the one that you're most familiar with, the one in your camera. It's a reflected meter. Now, reflected meters measure the light that bounces off of the subject and is on its way to the sensor. So that light already has information about the subject in it. They're the meters that are built into our cameras. And anything that those meters see return an exposure value that will give you 12.5% gray. Now, 12.5% gray is almost visual middle gray. So if we're getting a 12.5% gray reading, it's concrete, uh, it's worn asphalt, and if you're taking a picture of a Caucasian, that means that they are looking really dark. If you're taking a picture of a dark-skinned individual, they're going to look really light because the meter doesn't know. Now, the best part about our cameras is they're really, really smart. And Nikon has something called matrix metering in it. Canon has something called evaluative metering. I'm sure there's a Sony equivalent and most camera manufacturers have them. And what they've done is they've built a database of all kinds of different situations. And what the camera does is it looks at where the meter is reading and it says, okay, this looks like maybe it's a silhouette. So I'm going to automatically overexpose so people can get detail in a backlit subject. Well and good, unless you want to shoot a silhouette. Then you've got to figure out how to override that. I'm going to show you a way that you can get the right exposure every single time and it's really easy. But let's talk about middle gray for just a minute. Middle gray in Photoshop is 127. Now why 127? Well when Photoshop was written there were 256 shades. Zero is black, 255 is white, so you got 254 tones of gray right in the middle is 127. If you're using Lightroom, they've changed the numbering system. It's 50.2%. But it's, it's really right in the middle of a grayscale and the way our eye looks. Now, where this came from is Kodak. Remember Kodak? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, they were really popular for a lot of years when it came to photography and not so much anymore. But Kodak got together a bunch of people in Rochester and uh, they put gray swatches out on picnic tables on a bright sunshiny day between the hours of 2 
or 10 and 2 in the, in the afternoon and asked people which one fits in the middle. And then they averaged them and came up with 18%. And they based the exposure and how film would work on that. Well, logarithmically, film isn't as good as digital is. So if you take 18% gray, add one stop of exposure to it, you would double the reflectance. That would give you 36% reflectance, right? That makes sense? Then, if you add another stop of light, 36 would go to 72%, right? Here's where it gets kind of hinky. If you double the amount of light again, 72 doubles to 144%, and frankly, you can't do that. So in film, on ectochrome or uh, any of those transparencies like Kodachrome or Fujichrome, white was plus two and two thirds stops. That was where the, the film actually had no detail in the emulsion at all. Well, when digital came along, the manufacturers rejiggered the numbers. And I'm going to talk more about that in a few minutes. So in a reflected meter, if I take a meter reading of a white subject, it is going to be 12.5% gray in the photo. Now, I don't expect you to take my word for it, so I'm going to demonstrate. Uh, I have a photograph of the lovely Aunt Andrea here. And for those of you that have been at Photo Plus over the years, you may have seen her working at Canon's booth. And if I take that reading on that white swatch, it gives me the exposure of 125th of a second at F14, ISO 100. It's 2 and 2 thirds of a stop underexposed. Now, I took these into Photoshop and read the red, green, and blue values and averaged them together. And what I got was it really is visual middle gray, and that white, sp white swatch is now 129 on average. So it's within two points of being true middle gray. So I, I was pretty amazed. No, I didn't cheat. You think, you know, I know how to cheat, but I honest to God didn't cheat with this. So same thing holds true for a black subject. If I take a reading of something black and put that exposure on the camera, that black is going to come out as 12.5% gray. Uh, back to Andrea. Here's where the reading is taken. Right there. There's the exposure. And it's going to come out two and a half or two stops overexposed. Now, this again is visual middle gray, and on average, it's 127. So I took the R, the B, and the G, the RGB values, added them together, and divided by three. That's what I mean by averaging the RGBs. So you can see that, true enough, the reflected meter works exactly as advertised. And then finally, as you would well imagine, if you shoot a gray subject, it's going to be 12.5% gray. And since it already is, you're probably going to get the right exposure. The problem is we don't always have gray cards with us. And there's not always asphalt that's worn enough or concrete. Well, around here, there probably is. Green grass will do it, too, which is probably not as easy to find here in Manhattan as it is in the rest of the country. And the RGB average is 130. So you're getting the idea of how the reflected meter works. Once you understand how it works, you can use it, control it, and get a great exposure. Except with flash, because our cameras can't read studio flash. They can read speed lights if it's a proprietary speed light, but they can't read studio flash. We've got a, we've got a way to solve that. So you can see right here what the differences are. And the question really is, which one is a correct exposure? Well, if you think about it, these are all correct reflected exposures based on how you took the reading. So that's the story of reflected light meters. And I want to get into my favorite one, because these are almost infallible. They work incredibly well, incident light meters. And they work very simply by measuring the amount of light falling on the subject. That's all they do. And if you know how much light is falling on the subject, the tone of the subject, whether it's white, black, gray, or any shade in between any of those, doesn't matter. It will render properly when you take the picture. So they're very, very powerful. To use them, you aim the white dome at the main source of light, blocking all the other lights, take the reading, 
and then very simply, you set that on the camera. Done. Yeah, it really actually is that easy. So here's the reading right here. You can see F5.6 at 125th of a second. Um, that's the exposure set on the camera. And frankly, she looks terrific. That's exactly how, that's really how to do it right there. So the incident meter is a great tool. Now exposure, exposure is our creative choice. We can purposefully overexpose something. We can purposefully underexpose something. We're the creators, it's our camera, it's our lights, it's our digital media, it's our time in the computer. So whatever we want to do, we are allowed to do that. So you're gonna hear a lot of people talking about, well, it's not the correct exposure. Well, what is correct? Isn't it what you want it to be? Sure it is. Okay, so this is Tessa Hall. She is a radio personality in Washington, D.C and came to the studio, we were uh, playing around and she wanted a profile. Well now, this is a really nice profile. It's lit from behind with some wraparound light, it's using a strip light, one light. And most people stop there, they say, oh, it's working, yay, I've got it, good, I'm done. No. You've got to push lighting to get everything you want out of it. And nothing exists without comparing it to something else. And so I want to show you all of the iterations here. So this is the first shot, this is the test, and this is the beginning. Notice that we've got a really wonderful highlight on the top of her hair on the front. We've got another one coming around the front of her face. It's outlining the face, it's drawing the shape of the face. It's really pretty, it's, it's showing highlights on her shoulder. Backlight is really, really great. Here's a hair light added in. Now the exposure hasn't changed because I took the reading for the strip light, that was, the, that was my main light. So the main light doesn't have to be in front, it can be in the back. The last thing, believe it or not, is just a reflector to fill in the rest of the, of the, uh, uh, the face. And here's the lighting setup. This big light in the top is not being used. So number one, that's the strip bank that is lighting the edge of her face. Number two is an overhead and to the back softbox for the hair light. And number three is the reflector that Tomas is holding. That's all there is to it. It's a very, very simple lighting setup. Jim. Which kind of light were you using in the strip box that was filling the entire height of that? Was it, when it took ones, were you using the, the one with the frosted dome? I'm using the one with the frosted dome, the studio head, and I'll show you those. I'll show you those heads in just a minute. As a matter of fact, the big light that you see up there that we weren't using in this particular case is this one right over here, this uh, Dynalite Parabolic, and this thing is an absolutely stunning light. And I wish I wish we had a studio where I could show you how how brilliant this thing is. But what's wonderful about it is you can put the light dead center in the the subject's face and it will fall off two stops by the time it gets to her knees. So it makes her look like she's wearing stockings even if she's, you know, bare-legged. It, it's just great. Okay, so that's lighting a profile. Any, any questions about how that's done? The last thing is to um, have them move their eye a little bit over to the side. She didn't want that. She wanted the white, the white eyes. But if you take a look, and if I'm looking straight ahead, you can see all the eye white right here. So what you want to do is just take your finger and have the subject move their eye until it fills in the eye socket. Do you see that? See how it works? You see it? So that's uh, one other tip. Lighting fashion on location. Um, we have a really great museum in Atlanta called the High Museum of Art. For those of you that saw the original Hannibal Lecter movie, not the one starring Anthony Hopkins and uh, Jodie Foster, but the, the one before that, the uh, penitentiary is actually the first floor of the High Museum in Atlanta. And I got an assignment to do a fashion photograph to show off a lens for Sigma, which is their eight to 16 millimeter super ultra wide angle lens. It's a 120 degree angle of view at eight millimeters. 
So I, I got permission to scout the location. And then on a Monday, which is when the museum is closed, uh, they hired security guards and we showed up about three o'clock in the afternoon to make a photograph. All of the work had been done ahead of time. My stylist and I went out and got all the props and the dresses. We had uh, a makeup artist. And now they wouldn't let us have the makeup artist in the museum proper. That had to be done downstairs in the women's restroom. So the clothes and everything were down there. All of the props were laid out on the floor and the security guards were sitting over there and I thought, this is really cool, they want a safe. <laughs> it didn't really dawn on me that their thinking is photographers, camera cases, art thieves. <laughs> so there was a little bit of a disconnect in the thinking. But this was the location I picked and I want to build the lighting for you now so you get the idea. And we'll do it in a combination <laughs> of diagrams and actual photographs from the shoot. So here is the rough lighting diagram of the scene that you saw looking straight down. Now the camera is four feet away from the subject because it's an ultra wide angle and I've been very careful to level the camera so that there's no distortion. The pictures that you're going to see have had no distortion correction in them in Photoshop so I didn't go in and use the perspective control but I did make sure that the camera was about halfway up her body and dead level. So the initial light is the 22 inch beauty dish with the domed head and I'll show you that. We'll pull this uh, parabolic off and I'll show you the head a little bit later. And it's got a grid spot on it. When I'm photographing, I want to direct the attention exactly, the viewer's attention exactly where I want it. And to do that, I'm going to use the, um, the rule that your eye is going to go to the brightest part of the image. So I'm going to make her face brighter than anything else there, and I'm doing it on purpose. It's, and it's because that's where I want you to look. Then I want you to trail down the gown. Well, since I've got basically neutral colors, all that is is controlling the contrast. This is a very high contrast photograph. There's very little detail down by her feet. You can see her face great, but you can't see any detail in the dress. The rule for lowering contrast, and there's only one, you add light to the shadows. That's how you lower contrast. So contrast is the difference in brightness between the highlights, in this case her face, and the shadows, in this case the bottom of the dress, measured in f-stops. I don't care about the f-stops. I really don't care. Now, you'll notice that in all of these examples, I haven't been talking about doing any more than one light reading. In the profile, I took one light reading on the backlight going across her face, put that on the camera. Then I start with the other power pack on exactly the same number of watt seconds, and I make a picture. I shoot tethered practically on everything, so I'm looking right at my laptop, and I can read the numbers. And I look at it and say, yeah, that looks great. That's what I want it to look like. So I'm not really worried about taking a whole bunch of light readings. I've seen a bunch of photographers, and they're going around, poof, poof, poof. That's too many variables for me. I'm going to take the one reading on my main light, set it on the camera, and then fill in visually to where I get it to be beautiful. Now, I will tell you, I use a color monkey on my laptop from X-Rite, and I make absolutely sure that the, the screen is calibrated and it's not too bright. I also use the X-Rite Color Checker Passport to set the color, to neutralize the color, and I also use it to make sure that my whites have detail and that my shadows have detail. So those are things that I use religiously as tools to check to make sure that everything is, is where it's supposed to be for reproduction. My background, and we're all children of the times we grew up, my background is in film. The main reproduction device for photographers then was the printing press. It had a four stop range. If you wanted to have detail in the shadows and detail in the highlights, you could have something two, plus two stops or minus two. But that was it. Anything over that and the detail was gone, particularly in the shadow side. So the next thing was I took a six foot by six foot Shamira panel and put a diffuser over it. Just, it's like a bed sheet. 
In this case, it's sail cloth, the same stuff they make the sails out of for sailboats. And I put one of the location heads, like the one in the foreground over here, behind it, and it is just a little bit lower than her head so that her face isn't getting much light from it and it's going to fall off down the body of the dress. So you'll notice that it's brighter at her shoulders and darker at her feet and now you can see detail. So this is about a stop to two stops darker than the exposure set on the camera. I know, once, no, the question is, and I didn't change the exposure on the camera. Once I take the reading of my main light, I never change the exposure unless I change that light. Hard and fast rule. I don't know, and I'm, I'm so glad you asked the question, because how many variables can you solve for at once? Are there any math geniuses in the room? I'm certainly not one. I will admit to having taken algebra three times, and I passed it all three times, but I still don't understand it. But I know I can only solve for one variable at a time. And our cameras, our cameras, auto ISO, auto white balance, auto shutter, auto aperture, auto focus, which I'm really grateful for. But the other four, not so much. The camera's sitting there with the computer trying to guess what I want. The camera is not a good mind reader. So I want to eliminate those variables. I want, I want that to be my job. So I put it on, on M for mastery. <laughs> Just saying. So I'm not worried about any extra light that might hit her face. If it looks too bright to me on the screen, I'm, I will adjust that panel. But I'm not going to change the exposure, because the exposure is what I want, because I've got her face exactly where I want it. OK. So there's the final shot. And I want to break it down for you using the reflectance chart so you really get an idea of all of the thinking that goes into it and how what I've shared with you so far relates to every photograph that you make. OK. So let's just move Jessica over a little bit so we've got some room. Now, the ambient light is daylight, as you observed. The exposure for what you're seeing there is 160 of a second at f11. So f11 is the electronic flash. 160 of a second is controlling the light in the background and through the skylight. And that has been picked on purpose. It's, I didn't come with that number randomly. Now, the incident reading is the beauty dish with the grid, as I said earlier. That's where I got F11. The fill panel is one to two stops from her face to her feet. And actually, it's just at her shoulders down. So let's take a look at the reflectance values. Zero, or neutral gray, is right up there in that beam. Your mind says, no, it's a white beam, but it's really not. That happens to be the same exact reading. That's f11 at 160 of a second. There are your plus ones. Those are plus one stop. So you've got good detail in all of those areas. If it were plus three stops, there'd be no detail in the floor. So I'm holding really good detail everywhere. And yet the background is not overriding her face. Down the hall, minus one. In the foreground, minus one. Uh, minus two-thirds of a stop on the back wall. So I've accomplished having her face come forward. And where the light spilled off the edge of the panel, and you can see the shadow there over by the plus one, you can see the shadow where the panel is filling in. That is white light from the strobe going past the panel, hitting that edge. So that's a plus three. Now, the question that the other gentleman asked was, what happens when you vary your exposure? Well, let's say I wanted to really bring her forward. To bring her forward, I need to darken everything else. And he suggested I could change the amount of power and change the aperture. And it's exactly what I did in this case. So I'm going to bump up some things. This is the picture you just saw, but we're going to change some readings. I'm going to change the number of watt seconds 
from 200 to 400. So that adds, that doubles the amount of light on her face and doubles the amount of fill. So now I'm at F16. So at F16, everything's going to get a little bit darker. These are the original readings. Now we're going to change the reading. There you go. But her face stayed the same. Now take a look at the readings in the background. And I also bumped the shutter speed up a third of a stop. So now where the zero was, it's now a minus one. Where it was a plus one on the wall back there, it's now a zero. The hallway is a minus two. The floor in the foreground is a minus two. The sunlit area on the floor, which was a plus one, is now a zero. And over here on the wall, since it's still getting the same amount of, it's still getting the strobe light hitting it, it's still a plus three. So all of these relationships work absolutely. And once you understand how they work, it becomes very easy to make the photograph do exactly what you want it to do. And it's all about understanding the light and the exposure. Okay. Two hundred watt seconds. So if I go to four hundred watt seconds, I have to go from F11 to F16 to keep the same brightness. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. I, I, I know this is confusing. I, trust me, I, I really understand. And I'm so glad they're recording it here at B and H Event Space so you can go over and review it. Yes, sir. Yeah, I used the F11 exposure. The other one was too dark, it was too dramatic. They wanted to show off the lens, and so uh, I wanted everything to balance, because it was for a magazine ad. So again, I'm back to my printing press days, and I had to make sure that everything fell within that four-stop range. Even though we've got huge dynamic range now in our digital cameras, printing press doesn't. It's still four stops. It will always be four stops. Yes? That light is spilling onto that beam. Yeah, I mentioned that earlier. That, or yeah, I did. That yep. Because in the final image that I would use for myself, I'm going to crop it out. But I also wanted to show this because I knew I was going to be teaching this as lighting, and this is a really great example. Okay. Distortion on that lens is incredibly well controlled. <laughs> it is incredibly well controlled, and you should see it when you run it through Lightroom and use the lens correction. I did not do that on this because that would have been cheating. And I, I don't believe when I'm doing an ad for lens that I can that cheating is fair. You can imagine what it would I mean it would have looked absolutely perfect. So that's the uh, that's the difference using. Let's go ahead and get the 400 watt seconds so that you can see the comparison. There we go. So now you've got complete control. And I'd like to suggest that. Even though we've got incredible ISO capabilities now, I mean, I, I got a Canon 1DX and I am stunned at what I can get at, you know, 3200, 6400, 12,600. I'm just, I'm, I can't believe it. Because remember, I grew up, I'm a child of when I grew up, 100 ISO film was really good. Yeah. We had Kodachrome 25, that was awesome back then. High-speed ectochrome, you could push it to 320. Ooh. Yeah, you know, and, and, you're, and you're done. Now we've got incredible capability. The problem is that even though we can shoot in really, really low light, we still have to be able to light and bring the subject so it's the primary part of our composition. And I don't care how good the ISO is, if you don't have the light to make it do that, it's irrelevant. So photography is alive and well in spite of the fact that the, um, that the iPhone has become the arbiter of what a good photograph is. And that's not to run the iPhone down. What I'm suggesting is that because of the early days of the internet, because of the early days of the internet, when quality wasn't an issue and digital cameras couldn't deliver it, people were learning Photoshop and they forgot to learn photography. Now we're swinging back and learning photography again, and I'm really, really happy about that. 
friend of mine and I were on jury duty yesterday, day before yesterday actually, and um, he was showing me his wedding pictures and he showed me one of the pictures from his iPhone and the iPhone picture actually had more color and detail in it than the wedding photographer had done. Now I couldn't tell him this because he's a friend, but I thought, you know, you really, really didn't get value for what you paid for. And, I, and he thought they were great. And I'm going, hmm. So our visual education really wants to step up. And, and you're all ambassadors for good visuals. So when you see something that isn't as good as you can make it, take the extra time to, to put the light out there and, and to really build what's in your head onto your sensor and ultimately onto your screen and the print that you make. Whether you're a hobbyist or a professional, BNH has the answers to your questions. Experience a world of technology at our New York City Superstore. Connect with us online or give us a call. Our staff of experts is happy to help.